Hello and welcome to this Gorilla Guide webinar to creating and implementing a disaster recovery plan. This event is brought to you in partnership with Veeam, NetApp, Faction, Wheela, Rubrik, and Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We've got experts from all of these innovative technology companies lined up to present on today's topic of disaster recovery. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us on this special webinar event. This event is produced by Actual Tech Media, and my name is David Davis. I'll be your moderator for this Gorilla Guide webisode. Now, before we jump into it, just a little bit of information that you should know about this webisode. We've got some awesome prizes. I'll be talking about those here in just a moment, as well as the eligibility requirements for those prize drawings. We want this to be an educational event, just like the Gorilla Guide book series is. This Gorilla Guide webisode should help you to get all of your technology questions answered in relation to creating and implementing a disaster recovery plan. I encourage you to use the questions box on the left-hand side of your audience console, and we'll be doing dedicated Q&A sessions with each of today's presenters. We also want this to be a social event. I'll be talking about the hashtag for the event over on Twitter in just a moment. And finally, resources. We have some excellent resources there in the handouts tab on the left-hand side of your audience console, one for each of today's presenters. Some of them are links, some of them are PDF assets. I encourage you to check those out now for more information about today's presentations. The prizes for this webisode are three Amazon $100 gift cards. You must be live in attendance to qualify for the drawings, and I will be announcing the winner of these gift cards on the live event. If you're watching this on demand, I'm sorry, the drawing has already occurred. Prize terms and conditions can be found there in the handouts tab. All prize winners must submit an IRS form W-9 to Actual Tech Media. In partnership with the Gorilla Guidebook Club, Actual Tech Media has been donating to the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund and the One Tree Planted Charity. We encourage you to do the same, and we also encourage you to check out the Gorilla Guide Book Club, where you can download free educational IT books. These are complete ebooks. They're lengthy, but they're super fun to read, very educational, and you can download the complete collection over at gorilla.guide. Just put that in your web browser or also check out the link there in the handouts tab. The hashtag for today's event is Gorilla Guide and you can follow Actual Tech Media on Twitter and you can also follow me, David M. Davis. You can subscribe to all the social media channels for Actual Tech Media over on YouTube, Facebook, and our 10 on Tech podcast. We put all of our latest and greatest content over on LinkedIn, so make sure that you follow us there. Now, before I introduce you to today's first set of expert presenters, I want to do a little bit of stage setting here and just talk about the state of data protection in 2020 and beyond. There are a ton of disaster recovery statistics and data protection statistics out there on the web. If you search for them, they vary greatly, but most of them paint grim news for any IT organization that doesn't have a disaster recovery plan in place. One statistic that I found said that 93% of companies without a disaster recovery plan and disaster recovery systems who suffer a major data disaster are out of business within one year. That's 93%. You might as well just say all businesses without disaster recovery in place will be out of business if they have a major disaster. Another statistic here says that 96% of companies with a trusted backup and disaster recovery plan were able to survive ransomware attacks. So that statistic is almost flipped. We went from 93% who are out of business to 96% who have a plan in place are able to survive and keep their company running. When we get up into the mid and high 90s, I think it's safe to say that a company without a DR plan is going to go out of business if they have a disaster. A company with a DR plan is able to survive a ransomware attack and a major disaster. I think those are safe assumptions. And one last statistic that I found here, and this is on the high side, I must admit, said that the estimated cost of an unplanned outage event is $17,000 not per hour or per day, but per minute. And so I did the math, and yes, that's $25 million per day. And obviously that's going to be for a large company that's bringing in a lot of revenue, but you also have to consider the long-term business damage, the damage to the reputation of the company, even if you don't lose that much per hour or per minute from unplanned downtime, you have to consider the long-term damage to your company's reputation. Will the customers really come back? 
the key factors to consider in any sort of disaster recovery planning are first, you've got to start with the plan. You don't start with a product, you start with the plan and you start with the business requirements. What's the service level agreement going to be for the business? What is it that you need to prepare for? What level of recovery should you be planning for? What all is involved? And how will you meet the needs of the business? Because ultimately it's all about recovery and continued normal operations. The key metrics in any DR planning are always going to be RTO and RPO, the recovery time objective and the recovery point objective. Those are important to establish with the business because those are going to be your targets that you need to be able to hit. And then finally, you need to be able to test your plan. You're going to need to provide proof that it really works. Those are the key factors to keep in mind. But in 2020 and beyond, we have new considerations. Today's disaster recovery solutions bring changes. There are new innovations that hopefully make life for anyone doing DR planning much easier and much more efficient. But still, there are changes to consider. The new solutions offer increased automation, which means you get shorter RTO and RPO. You're able to swap physical sites, physical recovery sites or secondary data centers for virtual data centers in the cloud upon failover. And many solutions out there offer full-blown disaster coverage, plus regular testing and audit support and more. So if I think back to my time when I was an IT manager doing DR planning, I wish I had solutions like you'll be learning about on the event today because they are so much more comprehensive, so much more efficient. They offer much higher performance and just across the board, they're so much easier for anyone doing planning, data replication, testing, and recovery. And it's important to remember that the disaster recovery planning process isn't just a one-time thing. This is a life cycle. It's like the security wheel. We have the same disaster recovery wheel, the same life cycle here, where you start with a plan, you're going to test that plan, analyze the results, and constantly remediate or tweak the plan. Hopefully you don't ever have to implement the plan, but it should always be tested, analyzed, improved, and then retested. I hope that that helps to set the stage for our topic today because it's time to kick off today's Gorilla Guide webisode. And with that, I'm excited to introduce our first set of presenters on today's Gorilla Guide webisode. Welcome Mr. Robert Bell, Product Marketing at NetApp, and Mr. Jerome McFarlane, Solutions Manager for Backup and Disaster Recovery at Google Cloud. Robert and Jerome, take it away. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the session hosted by NetApp and Google Cloud. We'll be presenting a cloud-based disaster recovery solution that enables you to generate more value out of your data that you're protecting. My name is Robert Bell, and I'm a product marketing manager at NetApp, focusing on cloud storage solutions. And hi, everyone. My name is Jerome McFarland, and I'm a solutions manager at Google Cloud, focusing on backup and disaster recovery. So. NetApp has been a leading provider of data and storage management solutions for about 30 years. We have around 30, sorry, 300,000 companies that use NetApp technology in their data centers. We've partnered with Google Cloud so that we can ensure that the users experience a smooth transition as they expand their business to the cloud. Now, Google Cloud brings some really significant value to the enterprises. Uh, by enabling them to leverage the differentiated, differentiated infrastructure that Google uses to support its own operations. So enterprises adopting Google Cloud are protected by extremely robust multi-layered security. They get infrastructure that's globally available. They benefit from flexible pay-as-you-go pricing, and they gain access to innovative Google services like AI and ML as examples. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be talking about a cloud-based disaster recovery solution. But before we dive into the solution itself, I'd like to go over the trend of cloud-based ER. Now, what we see is that business continuity planning is a necessity. The data is growing rapidly and the cost of unexpected disasters and outages is just getting higher and higher. So to protect business operations, you really need a resilient infrastructure. But nowadays that's not even enough. You also need an infrastructure that can scale as the data grows and one that is flexible so that you can rapidly adapt to changes. And scalability and flexibility are really areas where cloud has an advantage. 
Yeah, no, that's absolutely right, Robert. You know, leveraging cloud infrastructure, it's a great way for enterprises to flexibly and economically satisfy their business continuity requirements. You know, Google Cloud Infrastructure is geo-distributed. It's designed to eliminate single points of failure that could cause downtime in the events of an unexpected disaster. And also because cloud infrastructure is elastically scalable, enterprises can flexibly expand their cloud resources on demand and thereby eliminate the need to invest in expensive, redundant DR hardware that would sit unused most of the time and also eliminating the need to physically manage and maintain that hardware. You know, finally, you know, many enterprises find that leveraging cloud as a DR location is also a great first step into the cloud. It allows them to build some familiarity with cloud computing at their own pace, and it provides a springboard for them to adopt additional value-add cloud services. Okay, so, so let's have a look at the solution that we're talking about here. Um, so the, this DR solution is provided by NetApp and Google Cloud, and it really lets you access the data in the event of a major on-premises outage. So basically you can replicate the production data from the data center to the DR site using various tools. But if you have NetApp's ONTAP software on-premises, then you already have the replication capability built in. So really all you need to do is to deploy an instance of Cloud Volumes ONTAP on Google Cloud and this will serve as your DR target, your disaster recovery target environment. And then you can use your existing snap mirror tool to replicate and synchronize the data between one or more data centers and the cloud environment. So the data is secured with encryption in transit and at rest. And all of the on-tap storage efficiencies like deduplication, thin provisioning, compression, compaction, all of these are preserved, which really means that you get to spend less on networking and less on storage. But really one of the biggest advantages of using Cloud Volumes on tap as the DR target in Google Cloud is that the data remains in the application native format. Now that means that the applications can access the data directly on high performance storage in the Google Cloud environment without the need for any data transformation. And what's more, the data is also automatically tiered back and forth from the high performance persistent disks to low cost cloud, Google Cloud storage, depending on whether or not you're using the data. So this whole uh, arrangement significantly reduces the overall costs and it ensures that you get high performance on demand. Yeah, and, and from an architectural perspective, one of the key benefits of cloud is that it provides enterprises with the ability to make choices. You, know, you can have active infrastructure staged and running to meet low recovery time objectives, commonly referred to as RTOs, or you might choose to spin up infrastructure only after a DR event occurs. And with Google Cloud, you know, our customers have the flexibility to really closely align their costs with their business continuity needs. So, um, yeah, we spoke about the solution, but you know, according to Murphy's Law, the more you invest in disaster recovery, the lower the chance that there will be a disaster. But seriously, there is a general sense that the data in the DR environment is just sitting there, not being used. And, and Jerome, you mentioned that before. But you know, what I said earlier was that, that Cloud Volumes on tap lets you store the data in its application native format, which means you can actually attach the applications to the data in the DR environment on Google Cloud. But, if you access the DR data, then you would actually interfere with the synchronization with the source production data. So we have a really cool solution for this problem. Cloud Volumes on tap actually lets you take a snapshot of your data environment and turn it into an active clone of your data. So if you're familiar with on tap at all, and you've probably heard of this before, being called flex clone. So let's say, for example, you wanted to test your DR environment to validate that it will perform as expected in an event of an outage. All you need to do is create a clone, run tests, and then you delete the clone. You've completed validation of the DR without affecting the data in any way. And because this whole system supports uh, APIs, a lot of our users really create their own scripts for automating this whole DR validation process of cloning, testing, and deleting using the automation tools of their choice, like Ansible or Terraform. And one of the nice things about these active data clones is that they really don't require any additional disk space 
until there are changes made on the clone or on the parent volume. So that means that you can create dozens of independent working environments that can be accessed by multiple teams. And these clones are also created instantly and at no additional costs. So this is really something you can leverage where your teams can run multiple jobs in parallel and then simply delete the clone when they're done. And all this takes place without affecting the original data at all. Yeah, that's pretty cool, Robert. I mean, these, these capabilities from NetApp, they open up the ability to leverage all the unique advantages of Google Cloud, right? By efficiently providing these independent application compatible data environments, the enterprises can now activate their data to extract additional value. And activating data for use cases like DevOps, AI, ML, analytics, all these things are now possible. You know, taking analytics just as one example, you know, compute is often the most constrained resource for enterprises seeking to rapidly analyze their data. And with data aggregated in cloud, those constraints are removed as Google Cloud's compute resources can be scaled out on demand and then scaled in again once processing jobs are completed. So with this kind of a solution, cloud doesn't only provide a home for the DR data, it also provides a flexible platform for actually activating that DR data. Okay, so just to summarize, um, the NetApp and Google Cloud NetApp solution really provides a secure, cost-effective environment for disaster recovery that gives you the flexibility to adapt to changes. With Cloud Volumes ONTAP on Google Cloud, you can activate your DR data to accelerate development and boost analytics. And if you're an existing NetApp customer, it really only takes a few clicks to replicate the ONTAP on-premises environment to Google Cloud. So I'd like to thank you all for your attention and please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. All right, excellent presentation. Thank you, Jerome and Robert. A really cool stuff that you guys are doing there at NetApp and with Google Cloud. I've just brought up the poll question for everyone out there in the audience I wanna call your attention to, but what additional information would you like about the NetApp solution? And I'll leave that up there for a few moments and allow everyone to answer that poll. Uh, we will be doing a dedicated Q&A session, you know, coming up with um, a, a panel of presenters. So make sure that you get your questions in early there using the questions box. And we'll be doing our best to cover all of those questions during the Q&A. If we don't get to any of the questions uh, or if we don't have time, we will certainly, you know, forward those to the presenters and hopefully they can respond to you via email after today's presentation. Thank you everyone for responding there to the poll question about NetApp. Uh, this is a fast paced, short event, relatively short event. So uh, we gotta keep this moving. Uh, again, thank you for the poll responses. It's now time for our next presenter. I'm excited to introduce Mr. Nathan Mills, Cloud Consulting Architect at Faction. Great to have you on Nathan, take it away. Hello, and thank you for joining, creating and implementing a disaster recovery plan for your organization. Presented by myself, Nathan Mills. I am a consulting cloud architect in the managed services department at Faction. I have many years in virtualization and disaster recovery, uh, which is something I specialize in. So first things first, why do we need a DR plan? Well, simply put, reliable success is only accomplishable through documentation and muscle memory, which means that our diagrams and runbooks <clears throat> need to be very well maintained, very clear, and very simple. They will help you catch mistakes or items that you may have overlooked in your plan. <clears throat> it will also assist you in quickly training up new staff or unlikely parties people that you may have not expected to have to run your DR plan. To take that further, your experts may not be available when it's time to implement or run your disaster plan. None of us know when that's going to occur. So documentation is key. As an example, I used to work at a local bank where it was myself and one other person in the IT team. If both of us were unavailable to a physical catastrophic, catastrophic event, uh, we had to make sure that we had documentation that any member of the bank, including our accounting and finance departments, would have been able to run on their own. 
We provide that we provided that to them in a physical format in a sealed case, which was stored at their homes. The case contained very detailed instructions on how they, as non-technical members of the company, would successfully enact the DR plan. It was sealed and only meant to be opened upon uh, request of either a member of IT or the executive staff at the bank. So understanding that example, we can see how important it is to have solid documentation. Now as a managed service, like Faction, we can help with our 24 by seven staffing of professionals. And we also provide a bespoke service that will help illuminate possibly overlooked areas of your plan and make sure that your DR plan and the tests between that are successful. <clears throat> so before we can build our plan, we actually need to plan for it and build that foundation. So first things first, we'll need to identify the appropriate departments and the heads of those departments or possibly liaisons to those departments that will help provide us with reliable information about the workloads that are critical to those clients. We need to understand how those groups currently consume those IT endpoints and make sure that we have a plan to replicate that after the failover to the DR site. Are those clients currently using SSL VPNs? Are they uh, using DNS? Uh, any of those types of things. Just make sure you're understanding how they, how they connect to it and replicate that. <clears throat> make sure that you're prepared with criteria that you can provide to those stakeholders to determine what's really in your scope and out of scope based on the available human and cash resources that you have. As an example, you might go to one of those departments and to them, everything that they utilize is critical to the success of the company and it all needs to be tier zero, right? To, have, to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So we need to make sure that when we approach those teams, they understand what our criteria are and how we determine what is tier zero, tier one, tier two. Do you need everything to fail over at once or do we need things to already exist on the other side to help support that, like Active Directory? <clears throat> Are there databases that don't really play well with third-party replication solutions? And so we need to use something more native, which requires both of them to be on at the same time. Something like that. Does this data need to be simultaneously available within multiple data centers or hyperscalers at the same time? I mentioned that because that's one of our, our core competencies here at Faction. If you have a requirement like that, let us know. <clears throat> Once you have every, everything tiered out or as well as, as you can at a certain stage, make sure that you're documenting that and you're actually putting the, the business case for the prioritization on each level. You may, have to, uh, you may have to defend that decision at some point. Then take those, uh, those tierings and spread them out as much as you can to save that performance for your DR plan as opposed to one large failover with a resource free-for-all. We can help you figure out the best practices, scoping, performance optimization, <clears throat> and all those things required for that repeatable success. Next, we need to put that plan into practice, right? Runbooks help eliminate that human error. Just follow the plan. So your runbook should be built for the audience that maybe you don't expect. Maybe this is a, a not a highly technical person who was just woken up at 3 a.m. and they need to enact it. Your runbook needs to reflect that audience. Maybe you have a long phone list of people that you need to call when you have to enact a DR or, or when uh, DR needs to be enacted. And this is the last person on that list. Make sure you've planned well for that scenario. Test frequently, as frequently as you can. The more you test, the better your documentation will be and the better your muscle memory will be to perform those actions. Make sure that you're rounding back after those tests and updating your runbooks, diagrams, things of that nature. Now, we can also help run, uh, build runbooks on your behalf and can either fully run your DR plan and tests or just assist in running that several times a year if you so prefer. We can also help keep all that documentation up to date on your behalf and represent any changes that need to be made from the testing. 
So in review, make sure you're documenting everything. It's very important. Even some trivial things can catch you up, but running those tests and getting that muscle memory should bring those to the surface for you. <clears throat> we need to ask important questions and understand what's really required from each business unit for the success of their critical business needs. It's our responsibility to understand that. Understand how they consume that data now or those resources and services now. And how can you help them do that after you're, you declare DR failover? What does that look like? Make sure you're not leaving that out of the process. Keep a close eye on your scope. The scope of this process is important as well in the in, the in solution. Scope, scope creep is real, as we all know, and it can cause very serious heartburn to both your human and budget resources if you let it get out of control. It's always tempting to squeeze as much as you can out of a solution, <clears throat> but be sure that these are chan changes that do not have negatively affect your ability to reliably and easily enact your DR plan. Keep things as simple as you possibly can. Remember, you might be the person waking up at 3 a.m. to run this plan yourself if you don't have faction to assist, right? So as a, as a uh, second to last point, run as many tests as you possibly can and use the outcome of those tests to update your documentation your run books, your diagrams. Otherwise, we at Faction can do it for you. Again, make sure you're documenting everything, you're documenting it frequently, and you're documenting it well. So a little bit more about us at Faction. <clears throat> we are a managed services provider that specializes in DR as a service. You'll get access to professionals that are highly experienced in all manners of DR solutions. We'll handle your DR for you, if you so choose, your diagrams and your runbooks, or we can assist if that's your preference. We're staffed 24 hours a day by seven days a week by 365 days a year, so we always have your back, regardless of when disaster strikes. We have nine data center locations spread over the United States and Europe. We support many types of software and hardware-based solutions like SRM, Veeam, Zerto, SyncIQ, Unisphere, and many, many more. And again, if you have a need to make that data available in multiple places at once, multiple hy hyperscalers or data centers, we can help out with that too. It's another one of our core competencies. So on that note, I'd like to thank you all for attending. Again, my name is Nathan Mills, Consulting Cloud Architect with Faction, and I'm very happy to have spoken with you today. Thank you and have a wonderful one. Great presentation there, Nathan. Thank you so much. A really cool stuff that you guys are doing at Faction. I've just brought up the next poll question I wanna call everyone's attention to, it's on the screen. Uh, what additional information would you like about the Faction solution? Um, the folks at Faction have been uh, really helpful and educational in all their content that they've delivered, uh, not only on this event, but also on our Megacast and Ecocast events as well. Uh, when it comes to DR, it seems like they would be a, a great uh, company to help really kind of handhold uh, any enterprise through that process, which can be daunting and complicated. So uh, if you'd like information about Faction from Nathan, uh, please just go ahead and indicate that there on the the poll on your screen and keep those good questions coming in i'm queuing those up for the q a session that we have coming up after our next presentation uh, we do appreciate those questions uh, this is a slightly different format we're trying to do a panel discussion here on this event so uh, it'll be just a little bit longer before we get to the questions but thank you again for all the excellent questions and thank you to the responses to the poll and now I'm excited to introduce our next presenter on today's Gorilla Guide webisode. Welcome to Adi Krishnan, Technical Architect at Wheela. Take it away, Adi. Hello, and welcome to today's webinar on bringing your A game to disaster recovery. In this webinar, I will be going over some of the 
some of the main elements that you would need to use in order to create a disaster recovery plan right from scratch. So here is our agenda for today. So I'll be giving over a quick um, and giving you some facts about Vila. Uh, secondly, I'll be going over some of the goals that you would like to achieve during a disaster recovery process. Uh, then I would like to discuss some of the key challenges in creating a disaster recovery plan. Finally, we'll be talking about what Vila can do for disaster recovery and then go on to the live demo section of the Vila solution. So a quick uh, idea of what Vila does. Vila is a Silicon Valley based company. It has a global partner presence all over the world across Asia, America, Australia, the Middle East and so on. And over the past few years, the technology uh, that the company um, uh, technology of the company has been widely recognized and this has helped the company win a few different um, uh, awards over the past few years in VMworld and Interop. Uh, the core technology of the company itself is agentless deep packet inspection that can identify about 3,000 different applications uh, right out of the box. Uh, it includes application dependency mapping, being able to identify uh, the application dependencies across an entire chain of application and finally use correlated full stack visibility to troubleshoot problems within the infrastructure uh, within the network and so on so let's get to disaster recovery so while planning for disaster recovery there should be a couple of goals uh, that you do uh, take into effect so firstly you would want to look at how your environment should be before a disaster the environment should be extremely resilient in order to understand and see if your environment is resilient you would need to you would need to have a tool that can help you understand that and show you any bottlenecks within the environment as soon as a bottleneck is seen if it can be fixed a disaster can be avoided secondly after disaster it is in some cases it is inevitable to clear out all the bottlenecks within the environment and it might it might actually cause issues and which might lead to a disaster recovery event. So in those particular cases, it is really important that the disaster recovery event preserves the continuity of service for customers based on their SLA. This means that most customers should not even know that a disaster event, recovery event took place. Secondly, it should be able to restore employee productivity. Any employees who lost access should now be able to gain access and continue their work as they were doing previously. And finally, the most important is to be able to recover any lost data that was lost prior to the disaster recovery event. So what are some of the key challenges in creating a disaster recovery plan? First of all, it's important to really know what is going on in your environment, what are some of the most business critical services, and once these business critical services are, uh, are discovered, we need to be able to prioritize them to make sure that uh, such a service is really important for the organization. Secondly, it's very important for us to know what the application dependencies are, how each of the VMs are connecting to one another, is very very crucial as we create a disaster recovery plan. Thirdly, it is very very important to keep SLA in mind and make sure that poor performance goes unnoticed so that customers who have an SLA with your organization and uh, do, do not do not have any uh, issues during the disaster recovery process. And finally, once a disaster recovery event takes place, it is important for us to start planning how we can go back to normal. So these are some of the key challenges in creating a disaster recovery plan. So Vila is a solution that can help you during this entire disaster recovery planning process as a four-pronged method uh, from assessments, optimization, validation, and monitoring. Vila can help you throughout the process. Uh, with assessments, Vila can provide you with an agent list an automated process to identify um, all the different virtual machines within your environment. Secondly, in order to optimize all the resources, Vila can tell you all the resources required by a mission critical applications. Thirdly, in order to validate all the whether the disaster recovery process was a success or not, Vila can create a baseline 
as a before and after method for you to quickly see what's going on within your environment. And finally, Vila can help you monitor any ongoing performance related problems that may be occurring within the DR site or within your production site as a matter of fact. So now let's go on to a live demo so that I can show you some of these some of these processes through which Vila can help you with disaster recovery planning. Vila can help you create your disaster recovery plan by easily and automatically identifying all the different applications within your environment. In this demo, we're going to take a look at how Vila can help you do that and see quickly from your production environment what are the mission critical applications within your environment. In this particular case, the mission critical application is a web server which has a backend database and you can see all the front end applications to it. There is a VDI there are VDI connections to it. There's a thin client uh, that's talking to the VDI desktops, the VDI desktops in turn communicating to the load balancer and the load balancer talking to the web server and the different databases within your environment. To make sure your environment is resilient to any disasters that could occur, you can quickly see and uh, troubleshoot any problems that take place within the environment. In this particular scenario, you can see that there is a red line between the application load balancer and the web server indicating that there's an issue. And by simply clicking into it, you can see that the web service has an issue uh, with an application response time of about three seconds. By drilling down, you can quickly troubleshoot to see if there's any infrastructure problems, uh, network problems, or transactional problems within the environment. Uh, in this particular case, you can see that the issue is mainly related to the CPU health of the environment. You can actually drill down and see what is causing these different CPU related issues as well. In order to create a disaster recovery plan, Vila also provides you with the facility to export this application dependencies for your mission critical applications into a CSV file, as you can see here. This application dependency map spreadsheet provides you with a list of all the different sources, the gateways that it goes through, the destination, each and every port that is being used and what application is being used. So this entire spreadsheet can be used as a checkbox for you to quickly see if those connections are taking place within the environment. Finally, before to make sure your environment is also resilient, you need to ensure that your environment is right sized and resilient to any failures uh, within the environment. So Vila can provide you with right sizing reports that tell you all the resources provisioned within your environment. And in this particular case, all your mission critical applications, the number of CPUs, the number of memory that has been allocated to it and tells you whether the environment um, has been over provisioned or under provisioned according to those standards. In this particular case, some of these virtu virtual machines have been over provisioned, which uh, in this particular case uh, could cause like higher CPU uh, utilization within the host itself. So once a disaster happens, it becomes very, very important and crucial to see what goes on within the environment. And Vila can help create dependency maps that allow us to do that as well. These application dependency maps can be baseline. So any connections that previously occurred and do not occur within the environment right now will be baseline and shown as seen here. Any white dotted lines that you see uh, are, basically uh, are basically connections that do not occur after the disaster has, stri uh, has striked, which essentially means that some of these services are not available to your end customer, which basically in some cases could break the SLA. So Vila can help you quickly identify if there are any broken connections uh, based on the baseline within the environment so that you can advance your disaster recovery and ensure that your, your, meet, your company meets the SLA itself. Finally, in order to troubleshoot any problems within uh, the dis disaster recovery site, Vila can also provide you with advanced uh, statistics on each of the different virtual machines. Vila can provide you with uh, statistics and show you uh, um, the show you the uh, conversations of different virtual machines within your environment and uh, tell you if there are any potential problems that can be seen within the environment. So overall, Vila can be used as a tool to proactively monitor prior to, uh, to, to a disaster. And finally, in case of a disaster, Vila can be used in order to monitor uh, in order to monitor if all the different connections 
have been set up according to the baseline. So finally, before I let you go, um, Vila has a special offer for all the attendees that are attending this 10 minute webinar. Uh, you, you, can, you have the opportunity to receive a $50 Amazon gift card um, if you email sales at vila.com and request a demo a call with, a Vila, with the Vila expert team. So any attendees, uh, who uh, any, anybody who emails sales at vila.com uh, and requests a demo is eligible for this offer. And please feel free to let us know what your disaster recovery problems are and we'll be glad to assist in any way possible. And thank you very much and thank you for listening to this webinar and hope to talk to you all soon. All right, cool presentation there. Thank you so much, Adi. Uh, for everyone out there in the audience, I've just brought up the poll question. What additional information would you like about the Wheela gift or the Wheela uh, solution? So uh, there's a number of options on there. Of course, we appreciate your response. We'll forward that to Audi. Uh, it was really generous, I thought, of Audi to offer this special gift card. Uh, if you email sales at wheela.com, it's U-I-L-A, you can um, you know, get a demo lined up with them. And if you go through that demo, uh, they say that you'll get an Amazon gift card. So very cool, very cool. Make sure that you check that out with them uh, separately after this event or you know, send an email now before you forget might be good. If you think that this product can really help you in your environment with disaster recovery, uh, I love how it can do application mapping without the need for agents, you know, in, in looking at what you need to protect, uh, developing those dependencies. Uh, sometimes you think you know what's dependent on another application uh, or another system or service, but once you perform a real application mapping with a tool, you find out that what you knew wasn't always uh, was wasn't always one hundred percent accurate. So you might find some surprises actually when after you do that application mapping that are going to seriously affect your disaster recovery plan if you want that DR plan to be successful. So again, thank you for the live demo, Audi. Really cool stuff. We are now about to kick off our first panel discussion. All right. And so to kick this panel discussion off, uh, I'm going to, I want to again introduce you, uh, Audie Krishnan, Technical Architect at Wheela, and Nathan Mills, Cloud Consulting Architect at Faction. Uh, Audie, Nathan, here we go. Let's see what we've got. Uh, Nathan, there's a question here for you. They're asking, what's the most frequently overlooked part of a disaster recovery plan? Uh, well, interestingly enough, that tends to be once your data is on the opposite side, how do you intend on consuming it? So how do your users currently consume that data and how will they access and consume that data and services on the opposite side? It's very important to keep that in mind. Okay, excellent. Good advice. Adi, I've got a question here for you. They're asking if it's possible for Wheela to alert them if there's a dependency change in the infrastructure or applications. Uh, yes, absolutely. So Vila helps uh, alert you if there's any dependency changes. So we have a couple of uh, different things that we can do. So we can baseline uh, connections based on a week or a month time frame, And we can tell you uh, over the course of um, time whether there are any baseline changes that have occurred uh, prior to, uh, prior to the, 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 uh, the effects of uh, the dependencies. Right. So apart from that, we can also tell you, like, you know, if there are any new connections that are taking place or any connections that are not taking place anymore. So that helps you identify if there are any uh, connection drops in that perspective. Absolutely. And to clarify on that, does the tool map just application dependency mapping or can it also provide details on the, the servers and the storage that are behind that application? Uh, absolutely. So Vila automatically identifies, automatically and agentlessly identifies not just the applications, although we do identify, you know, 3,500 different applications, we can also, you know, uh, query the entire like topology of your data center and see all the different virtual machines, physical servers, gateways, and things of that sort within your environment. So this is all done automatically for you. And apart from that, you know, we can, you know, look at every single virtual machine, what is the storage or the data stores that they're connected to. So we provide you with 
an entire access to both the application dependencies as well as infrastructure dependencies when it comes to your storage, your compute resources, and so on. Very nice. Nathan, I've got another question. This one's for you. And it is, how can we make sure that our disaster recovery actually works when we need it? Mm. So that uh, comes purely from repetition. So making sure that you have repetition on all of your documentation, your run books, and the muscle memory of doing it over and over and over, I really can't stress that enough. Uh, that's what makes sure that you do it. But every time you have an opportunity to run a test, uh, you probably should. Excellent advice. And Adi, next question is for you. Can the tool support mapping applications and infrastructure running in the public cloud as well as on-premises? Uh, yes, absolutely. So Vila helps monitor both on-premise as well as the cloud, uh, right? But uh, one of the things that we've seen over the past couple of years is that although people have uh, in infrastructure in the cloud, their main primary data center in the cloud, they prefer to have their DR sites uh, on, the, on the cloud. So it becomes very, very important to map uh, not just applications on premise, but also in, in the cloud the same way that we do. Uh, and in, in, the, in, in this particular, and in, in a lot of cases, uh, it becomes very important to see the connections also between your um, on-premise sites to your uh, disaster recovery sites to see if like, you know, the replications are going on, uh, to see if um, there are any uh, uh, challenges in terms of bottlenecks between, uh, between the two sites in, in terms of uh, replications and things of that sort. Very nice. And Nathan, a final question here. This one's for you. How can we make sure our data is available in all the locations that we need should we have a disaster? Well, that just so happens to be a core competency of Faction, uh, which is we can accept your data in innumerable ways and then present those into other data centers, uh, be it ours or others, as well as hyperscalers like AWS, um, VMC, Oracle Cloud, GCP, things like that nature. Uh, and we can also present them to all of those places at once or just one. It's really up to you. We're uh, quite bespoke in that, in that instance. Very cool. Thank you, Nathan. Certainly. And Adi, here's another question. This one's for you. How can you identify disaster risks? Is, it, is that possible? Uh, yes, that's a great question. And uh, one of the things that I like to talk about when you talk about um, disaster risks is what exactly comprises of the disaster risks and what are some of the main critical applications that could bring your business down, right? So those are your main disaster risks. And the way Vila can help you identify your disaster risk is it can help you classify your entire mission critical application uh, using, the, uh, using, using the deep packet inspection engine that's built into the tool, right? So it can identify, you know, 3,000 different applications. And then if it sees your ERP servers or your uh, CRM tools that have some kind of an issue, we'll be able to quickly help you map and identify where the bottlenecks are within your environment. We'll automatically build the entire application dependency map for this business service. And as soon as a disaster strikes or something goes wrong, we'll be able to identify where the bottleneck, bottleneck is so uh, a disaster can be awarded in, that, in, those, in, 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 those, in those cases. Excellent, thank you, Adi. All right, thank you, David. All right, good stuff there in the Q&A. Thank you both, Nathan and Adi, and thank you to everyone out there who asked questions. If we didn't get to your question, we will do our best to get back to it after today's presentation. It's now time for our next presenter on the Gorilla Guide webisode. I'm excited to introduce Ashwin Shetty, Product Marketing Manager at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Great to have you, Ashwin. Take it away. Thanks, David. Uh, my name is Ashwin Shetty, and I work in HPE in the Product Marketing team. I'll spend the next 10 minutes uh, talking through how HPE has been helping customers modernize their data protection strategy. Now more than ever, data is the lifeblood of an organization and any incidents of data loss or application unavailability can take a significant toll on that business. With the recent rise in cyber attacks and exponential data growth, protecting data has become the number one job for many IT organizations. 
Whether you're hit by a natural disaster, hardware failure, data breach, or ransomware attack, you need to recover your data quickly and painlessly. As the importance and value of data grows, being ready to protect and recover that data is more vital than ever. You need your data back quickly and with as little disruption as possible. Your disaster recovery readiness needs to be flexible, allowing you to recover data, application, and virtual machines from any platform, efficient by aligning RTOs and RPOs easily with SLAs, simple with fast recovery through a scalable solution, and finally, versatile to protect data against all kinds of threats. It's not enough to simply have a stock disaster recovery plan. Modern disaster recovery must be planned with, within the larger business continuity plans of an organization. The broader mandate provides new opportunities to directly serve the needs of a business. It also requires new tools and procedures to effectively plan and respond. The three goals should be to reduce your disaster recovery cost. You can start with building multiple disaster recovery tiers to more effectively meet your SLAs, allocate your data based on business value, RTUs and RPO requirements, and support for offsite backups. The second one is recover your data wherever it is. Making sure your mission critical data is accounted for and accessible is crucial for disaster recovery. You should be able to recover on premises, in the cloud, from the cloud, or even in between the clouds. And the third one is avoiding vendor lock in. Disaster recovery to a certain facility, hardware, or cloud can drive up cost. You need to have the flexibility to recover workloads from an on premise location or multiple cloud locations. Now, let's look at mission critical disaster recovery. When it comes to disaster recovery, enterprises need to meet their SLAs, but they want the flexibility for the right RTOs and RPOs. And they also want a simpler experience, everything from managing replication to infrastructure. Mission critical applications demand no downtime. So in event of a site failure, you need synchronous replication with the transparent application failover or an asynchronous replication on premises for global distances or even asynchronous replication out to the cloud. HP Primera made waves in the industry with a 100% data availability guarantee. This is available for every customer and every array with just standard support. To protect against site-wide disasters, we built upon that with peer persistence and asynchronous replication. And now we have also added three site replication for peer persistence and faster asynchronous with near instant replication within a minute RPO. The key takeaway being it's a robust disaster recovery portfolio on HP Primera to address all mission critical environments. And it's very simple to set up. And the best part of it is it's all free with an all inclusive software. Nimble Storage is a proven enterprise platform with six nights measured availability across its install base. We have had peer pers persistence and asynchronous replication between two sites. And earlier in June, we have extended disaster recovery through three sites for that extra level of protection for metro wide disasters. What's key to point out here is nimble replication is simple to configure in just a few clicks and it's built into nimble operating system. And that the third site can also include the cloud via HP Cloud Volumes, which I'll be covering up in the next section. This is particularly valuable as it lets customers use the data for more than just insurance as HP Cloud Volumes can access all public clouds. Shifting gates, let's look at DR solutions for hybrid cloud. Let's understand the significance of our hybrid cloud. The unexpected events of the first half of this year have has transformed how we operate our businesses. With work from home as the new normal, the need to streamline, simplify core infrastructure services while ensuring remote productivity for employees has a new focus. Companies have had to adjust their spending practices in order to adopt an uncertain economy while still striving to drive innovation in the market. Enterprises, especially now, want to take advantage of the cloud experience, fast access to the resources, on-demand scale, pay-as-you-grow economics. 
hybrid cloud is not just a future it's it has now become a necessity hp cloud volumes provides you a suite of enterprise cloud data services that unlocks the potential of hybrid cloud for your enterprise with hp cloud volumes block we give you enterprise grade multi cloud services for storing and managing data in public clouds and hp cloud volumes backup is a 100% cloud based data protection service that allows you to securely and effectively backup and activate your data when and where you need it here's a closer look at hp cloud volumes block service delivered completely as a service with built in mobility between your on premises array and our cloud adjacent service take your data to the cloud for workload migration pipeline analytics or disaster recovery in one single step gain flexibility of choosing the right cloud for your needs with hp cloud volumes block we can present your data to compute in azure google or aws immediately without hassles of migration hp cloud volumes blocks brings all the enterprise storage features you will leverage on premises to the cloud from rapid recovery and restores snapshots to enterprise grade availability and unlike other cloud offerings we do not expect you to manage an array in the cloud hp cloud volumes block is a hundred percent cloud based and delivered as a service so you're free from administrations and empowered to innovate with no lock-in free data mobility and complete visibility hp cloud volumes block delivers the perfect cloud storage solution for your hybrid cloud requirements now let's look at cloud data protection for modern enterprise hp cloud volumes backup is an on-demand cloud service that enables customers to instantly start backing up to the cloud it is effortless because it allows customers to protect anything because we can help customers augment their data protection into the cloud regardless of any primary storage array it does not matter because of our native integrations we have with all of the public cloud providers it's efficient from a dollar perspective because it's a true pay as you protect pay as you grow and optimizes cloud economics because we are optimizing the data movement to and from the cloud the cat built-in catalyst api provides source side deduplication that connects directly into the applications and the backup isps that makes the amount of data that you send to the cloud very small which allows for a more faster and efficient way of storing backup data in the cloud it is secure as all backups are inv invisible to ransomware your data is sitting separately from the operating system of your applications so hackers cannot access your data and we are able to provide the higher levels of security than others in the market it is flexible customers can backup their data into hp cloud volumes backup and then have the ability to recover it anywhere you can recover back on premises in the event you need that data or you can recover into public cloud like aws azure or google cloud to leverage that data for more purposes looking at how the disaster recovery process works customer want to get value out of the data to move beyond insurance because it's built on hp cloud volumes we have the ability to recover that data on the public cloud through hp cloud volumes block the seamless experience between backup and block allows for that data set that is being backed up to to be recovered anywhere customers have multi cloud flexibility to leverage that data without having to move it we are giving customers the maximum flexibility to move their data through hp cloud volumes backup finally your backup should not act as an insurance policy with cloud volumes backup you are able to restore the data on premises or in the cloud through hp cloud volumes block to leverage compute resources in the public cloud so that the data can be used for secondary workloads like test and development and analytics so that your backup data can turn into a business asset and finally modernizing disaster recovery is the key to keep pace with today's changing hybrid cloud environment and ensuring data and applications achieve always on availability while your organization will have its own set of requirements in general you should focus on cost efficiency simplicity and future readiness when architecting your disaster recovery strategy our disaster recovery solutions and services gives you the peace of mind that your data is rapidly recoverable always secure and provides value to your business without compromise 
thank you for joining us today and i turn it over back to david all right great presentation ashwin a really cool stuff that you guys are doing there at hpe with cloud volumes uh, i've just brought up this poll question for everyone out there what additional information would you like about the hpe solution and i'll leave that up for just a moment here and allow everyone to answer that uh, i do want to remind everyone that if you go to gorilla.guide in your web browser that will take you to the gorilla guide website and you can explore the library right there and download, uh, I believe, just about every book that we've ever published, which is, uh, I, I've lost count by now. Um, so many books, so many excellent educational resources. You can download them all, uh, read them in ebook form, and you know, learn a lot about what's going on. We've got uh, Gorilla Guides on Service Edge, uh, IoT, uh, IT asset management, containers shaping the enterprise, VMware vRealize operations, rapid restore from Flash, uh, production grade Kubernetes, intelligent data strategies, uh, hyperconverged infrastructure, ransomware prevention, uh, and much more. So make sure that you check all those out over at gorilla.guide. All right, thank you everyone who responded to the poll question there on the screen, we do appreciate it. It's now time for our next presenter on today's Gorilla Guide webisode. I'm excited to introduce Mr. Dustin Albertson, Manager for Cloud and Application Alliances in Product Management at Veeam. Dustin, great to have you, take it away. Hello everybody, I'm gonna walk you through uh, Veeam Backup for AWS. So. Veeam Backup for AWS is our cloud native product. It uh, backups and protects uh, EC2 instances and uh, EBS. So uh, it's deployed via the AWS Marketplace. You can see that if you go into the AWS Marketplace, search for Veeam, uh, you'll see that there's three uh, editions of Veeam Backup for AWS. Um, all three of these editions are essentially the same product. They're just licensed differently. So you have a free version, which can protect up to 10 instances with uh, no limits on the features or the timing or anything like that. Um, you have a free trial and a BYOL edition. Uh, this is uh, for a hybrid customer that maybe wants to leverage their Veeam Universal licensing uh, to protect these instances. And then you have a paid edition, which can be purchased and, and paid through the AWS Marketplace. So once you find the right edition or which one you want to deploy, um, it's a pretty easy process. You just click on it. Um, you would click continue to subscribe, and then it takes you through a cloud formation template to uh, deploy this into your environment. Um, there's also links to videos here that will walk you through it, uh, walk you through the process of the deployment and the configuration. Um, both of them are a pretty simple process, but you know, for this demo, we're going to act like that's already been done. And then once it's deployed, it's actually deployed as a uh, instance inside of uh, EC2. So you can see here that I've got my VBA, this Veeam Backup for AWS uh, version 2 instance deployed inside of my uh, EC2 environment. And this uh, T2 medium is the default kind of instance type. So once this is deployed, I'm able to log into my portal. So I'll just go to you know my IP address that I have here. And that opens this up, and then I'm able to log in. So I'm going to log in here. And once logged in, it's going to take me in. And this has already been configured. So we'll, I'll walk you through the configuration steps that are kind of needed to be done first. And then we'll talk through you know, what this means as far as the instances and how to protect and all that. So again, once you log in, there's a step-by-step -step kind of guide here. So you'll see the configuration step. And uh, you'll see, actually, let me go back. And you'll see that uh, you have to add an IAM role. Um, you create these workers. You add a repository. And, and that's pretty much it. Then you're ready to create your first policy. So an IAM role is, is pretty self-explanatory if you're familiar with AWS. It is the account that you're going to leverage to uh, connect into AWS to be able to perform these backup operations. Um, so it's really just permissions to, to achieve this. By default, one is created when you do the deployment, um, but you can come in here and you can add others or create one of your own and, and remove this one if you want to. 
Um, backup admins here are people that uh, are able to log into this and, and be able to perform uh, backup and restoration operations. So these two are, are a little different. This is the one that I just logged into here. So then we're going to talk about repositories. So a repository is a S3 bucket that we're able to put backups onto. Um, and we'll walk into what backups mean in this in this situation because there's going to be the concept of uh, EBS snapshots as well as backups. But again, this is just a, a S3 bucket where we can store backups. And then we have workers. So workers are instances that are, you can see up here, it's a temporary instance that um, whenever we need to move data. Um, so if we're going to take a, a snapshot and convert it into a backup, a worker is used in that process. Um, if we're restoring data out of S3, uh, a worker is going to be deployed during that process. And uh, it's important to note that these processes or these workers are only deployed when they're needed. And then as soon as they're done being used, they're removed. So uh, they're not going to sit there and incur charges and, and, and uh, use all of that. So again, once you have all three of those, those kind of configured, which that process could take a couple of minutes, it's not even a, a, that hard of a process, you're able to create your first policy. So if I exit the configuration here, I can see that I have some policies set up. Um, I have a repository set up. I've got three policies. Um, I'm protecting seven out of the 18 instances that I can see. And then I have, uh, you know, one alarm here within the last 24 hours. But it's, this is kind of your dashboard screen. And you can click into any one of these to go further down this, this path here. Um, but it, we'll walk down through this together. So Instances here is, of course, instances that this uh, this machine or this uh, Veeam Backup for AWS instance can see um, in all the regions that it's connected to. So it can see all of these uh, instances. And then you can easily tell if when the last backup was done on an instance, um, how many restore points there are for this instance, and which policy is protecting this instance. Um, so that's a pretty kind of easy way to see that. But... If you wanted to actually just see the protected data, you could click on protected data down here, and this takes you straight into, um, you know, the instances that are being protected and how they are, um, you know, which which kind of policies are, are here being protected on it. You click the restore points there, and you can see, you know, it says four, but, you know, where, where are these four? So we have two snapshots, and then we have two backups sitting inside the S3 bucket. And you can see the total size uh, of each of these. So uh, that's that's a pretty handy little uh, feature there. But this is also actually let me go back in here. This is also where you can kind of pick your one uh, you want to do. And if you want to do a restore, um, you can click that off from here as well. So if you want to uh, do a full instance restore or just the EBS volume, um, you can also do a file level recovery from here as well. So I'm going to close this. And the more important thing here is, is policies. So policies are what we use to protect uh, these instances. And if you look here, I've got a couple of examples or a few examples here of, of policy types. So we have one that's just protecting instances that are within the same region as, as, this, uh, as the uh, VBA instance. Uh, we have one that's a cross-region uh, policy, which means that it's protecting instances located inside of another region. And then we have a cross account policy here, um, which is pretty cool because this is protecting instances that are located inside of another AWS account. Um, so you can do multi-tenant or you can uh, protect other AWS accounts. So a lot of enterprises, for example, will have numerous AWS accounts for different departments. Um, and this will allow you to protect those instances that are running inside of that account uh, with this one. So. Um, we'll dig into one of these. Let's, for example, let's take a look at this cross-region policy. If I come in here, I can click Edit. And what this does is it gives you the ability to name the policy, uh, give it a description. You come next. You can choose which IAM role. Uh, so this is the cross-account role. Uh, this is the role within my account. I, I can even add uh, another role within the policy. Um, and I can check the permissions to validate that this, you know, the role that I'm using has the appropriate permissions to, to run the policy. Um, so there's a lot of things going on here that you're able to do. Um, I can choose the regions. So I can, I'm able to choose 
uh, one or I can you know highlight and select all and add all of those um, I'm able to choose the resources so for example this one I chose that one region and it's showing me the resources that I'm protecting but I can choose all resources I can protect the following resources either by instance or by tags so there's a myriad of ways there to choose which instances you want to protect a lot of people choose to use tags uh, to protect these instances so it's a pretty uh, handy feature there so I can cancel out of that and then uh, we have application processing here so we leveraging the S AWS SSM agent um, to take VSS aware snapshots on Windows instances so if you want to have that uh, you can just turn that on and then uh, we'll take VSS uh, snapshots so the next one here is is gives you targets so we're able to replicate snapshots so if you wanted to replicate a snapshot to a different region you can turn that on uh, you can choose you know which region you want to uh, send it to choose your account and whether you want to turn on encryption or not uh, for this one I just don't have that on so I'm going to turn that off and then uh, here's where you can say yeah I want to do backups so by default it's just going to do snapshots um, but I'm turning on backups here and then I'm storing them in the S3 bucket um, so I'll get to the difference between a snapshot and a backup here on this next screen so if we click in here this is our scheduling so this is all within this one policy we can do you know daily uh, weekly monthly or yearly so if I come in here and click this I'm able to choose you know which time of day um, I want to take snapshots or backups so let me talk about snapshots snapshots are of course EBS snapshots uh, the volume that's connected to the instances in e, uh, EC2 I'm just going to take a snapshot of that and then it's stored in, in EBS um, but let's say maybe I want for long-term retention I want to keep those uh, longer than I want to you know keep a snapshot maybe I don't want to have a lot of snapshots for you know they're expensive they cost a lot I'm able to take a backup and what that process does is it deploys a worker it mounts that snapshot to that worker and then we do a conversion process and convert that into a beam format and we store that on s3 um, you can keep it in s3 you can keep it there longer um, it also opens up uh, the possibility of, of uh, connecting to that data with your on-premises version of Veeam. I'll go into that here in a second, but just know that there's a couple different ways there to store. You can keep take snapshots, you could take uh, backups, or you could take both. It just really depends upon your uh, your use case there. But in this example, I'm taking you know a snapshot and a backup nightly at 10 p.m. Um, I'm keeping seven snapshots of my dailies, and I'm keeping my backups for 14 days. Um, again I have the same options to come in here and choose weekly I can choose which day of the week that I'm going to uh, take these weekly uh, backups and snapshots how many I want to keep and for how long and then again the same kind of concept with monthly I'm taking one each month um, I'm keeping only one of those snapshots and then I'm keeping it for for 12 months um, I also want to highlight here that whenever we do take snapshots we have integrations in with uh, AWS uh, so with EBS there is a change block tracking on, on snapshots so we're only actually taking the uh, amount of data that we actually need so uh, any change data that's happened we're only we're only moving that amount of data we're not actually moving you know if, if you have a hundred gig uh, box each time we're not actually moving a hundred gigs we're only moving the change rate data there but the cool thing here is we're actually going to give you a cost estimation of what it's going to cost to run this policy monthly so as you can see here we've got all these settings in here and we've got them set up and then it's, it's giving us an estimate of what it's going to cost to run this policy monthly uh, that's a pretty cool feature to have it, it, it helps you kind of estimate what you're going to be using um, you can come in here and tweak your settings to get to the right price um, but yeah this is this is a pretty cool feature to have to be able to know what it's going to cost you before you actually run the policy um, then you have some basic settings here where you can retry automatically um, I don't have email set up but you would have notification options down there if you wanted to do emails and then it just gives you a summary of, of all this um, you can actually run a permissions check from here as well and it'll, it'll simulate this policy and make sure that all the permissions are there I'm gonna click cancel here because we already had this run and, and as you can see it's got all that so 
in a nutshell, this is pretty much, you know, being back for AWS, it gives you a lot of options, a lot of features there. But I mentioned a second ago our on-prem product. So this is great for a cloud native customer or maybe a customer that has some, uh, some instances in AWS they want to protect. But briefly here, I want to talk about what about a hybrid customer or or maybe you have Veeam back up on premises and you, you know, you're just starting your cloud journey. So if you're doing this, let me go to my on-prem version of Veeam here. You can see that I, I have the ability now to right click here, add server, and I can add Veeam back up for AWS. So maybe I've already got an existing appliance that's deployed or I want to deploy a new appliance. I can do that now from within the Veeam console. So in this in this environment here, I've actually already connected um, my instance. So let me exit out of this, come down here. You can see Amazon EC2, and I've already have my uh, appliance that we were just on connected. Now what that does is it adds that uh, S3 bucket that we're using to store the backups in in AWS. It adds it as an external repository now, so that I can see the backups that are stored in there. If I come here to my home screen, I can actually see the jobs. If you remember correctly, that I can see the jobs that um, that I have running in AWS. I can actually create a new job here and see. I can create a new Amazon EC2 job, um, and and as well I can I can work with this data. So I can start this job from here if I wanted to. I can see statistics of it. Um, I can also see the snapshots. You know where they're stored and how many of them there are. I can click on my external repository here. I can see the data that's stored in S3. I'm also able to right click on it and perform the Veeam functions just like we normally would. So I'm able to do an instant Veeam re recovery. I'm able to restore it to Azure if I wanted to. I can restore it back to EC2. Um, I can export the disk. I mean, there's lots of different things here that you can do uh, with this data. I can actually create a new backup or job or a copy job. You can see I can choose EC2 backup here. So maybe I want to add one of these instances that I'm protecting and this is stored in S3 and I want to bring it back down on premises for, for whatever reason. So again, it's your data. We're just giving you multiple different ways to, to access that data. So I know that was a lot to kind of go through in a short period of time, but I just wanted to highlight some of the, the coolness or, or integration points that we're doing because in Veeam it's, it's important for us to, to kind of have that, uh, be together with you on your journey uh, to the cloud, no matter if you're cloud native, if you're just beginning that journey. Um, we've got multiple different routes to, to integrate with AWS as far as object storage, uh, protection of EC2 instances. Uh, we integrate in with VMware Cloud and AWS. So um, there's way too many different paths to discuss in you know, 15 minute demo, but um, you know, feel free to ask questions, feel free to reach out. Um, there's a lot of different options there for you. So thank you very much and uh, let's continue. All right, really cool demo there. Love the live demo. Thank you so much, Dustin, for taking time to do that. Uh, really give us step-by-step -step educational uh, walkthrough of how to use Veeam Backup on AWS, a cool new product from Veeam. Uh, many of you might not have seen it before. I've just only recently learned about it. So. Uh, hope that you enjoyed that demo as much as I did. I just brought up the uh, poll question there on the screen. I encourage you to answer the poll. We do appreciate that. We forward that uh, back to Dustin uh, for him to you know get feedback on the presentation and what additional information people would like. So thank you for answering that question. Uh, I want to remind everyone that this is the uh, Gorilla Guide webisode, and you can download Gorilla Guide books at gorilla.guide in your web browser. Also, we have our Q&A panel coming up after our next presentation with Rubrik. So all those good questions that have been coming in, we're queuing them up for that Q&A session. Thank you for those, by the way. And then finally, we will be announcing the winners of our three Amazon $100 gift cards after that Q&A session. So make sure that you stay tuned for that. All right. Thank you, everyone who responded to the poll question there on the screen. We appreciate it. And with that, I'm excited to introduce you to the final presenter on today's Gorilla Guide webisode. That is Mr. Matt Elliott, de Developer Advocate at Rubrik. Matt, take it away. Hello, and welcome to this session today. Uh, we're going to dive into what it takes to create a successful disaster recovery plan uh, for both DR testing and an actual disaster. So 
Uh, before we get started, I'm going to get my uh, big head out of the way here, and we will begin. So my name is Matt Elliott. I work as a developer advocate at Rubrik. Before joining, uh, I'd been in just about every IT position imaginable. More recently, I've been focused on network engineering and architecture. So prior to, to Rubrik, I worked at an MSP that provided uh, disaster recovery as a service, and I've been a part of many disaster recovery exercises, uh, and I'm excited to share my experience with you today. So from my past experience, I found that there are really three keys to a successful disaster recovery plan, and I'm listing them here in order. Uh, the first is people. Uh, successful DR planning requires time and input from many people across your organization. And the larger the company, the more people that will be involved. The DR, DR team should be representative of your company as a whole, and it will span almost every department. Second is process. Uh, we'll get into some details in a moment, but by the end of your initial planning, your team will have produced an impressive amount of documentation and procedures through this process. Third, technology. Now, if your data center looks like this, you may be praying for a disaster to happen. But in the end, you need to leverage the technology in your organization to keep your business running in the face of a disaster. So let's talk about the people in your organization that you'll need to facilitate a DR plan. Uh, plain and simple, you need executive buy-in. Hopefully your executives are the biggest supporters of your effort. They'll allocate budget and they'll have the authority to make sure everyone is willing to give you the time and attention needed for, your, for this process. But without their support, you will be fighting an uphill battle. Uh, if you and your executives don't see eye to eye on the need for DR or the cost of DR or the manpower required, you'll need to get on the same page before you can move forward. With executive backing, you can start building out your team. And that's gonna be made up of uh, first business unit stakeholders. Uh, these are the people that will identify critical applications, they'll identify success criteria for testing those applications, as well as any potential roadblocks, and they'll provide input to other teams as needed. Uh, next, application owners, uh, they're responsible for dependency mapping, as well as success criteria for application tests. They'll help unweave the sort of tangled web of communication between all of your critical acts so that you can replicate the whole environment uh, at a DR site. Third, infrastructure engineers. Engineers perform the bulk of the work during tests and events. They specify DR site sizing, inventory, setup and connectivity, as well as automation tools. As you build that team, make sure to account for team members that are potential single points of failure. Uh, I've seen more than one effort fall apart because a critical team member didn't complete an assigned task somewhere. Okay, process. This is the fun part. Actually, I'm lying. This is my least favorite part because it's the hardest. Uh, this is where your project managers will shine. You want to start by uh, determining your RPO and your RTO. RPO, or your recovery point objective, defines basically how much data you're willing to lose in the case of a disaster. And really, this correlates with the frequency that your backups occur. So, I mean, you can only restore to the point where your last backup exists. You also want to set your recovery time objective, or RTO. And that's the target time frame for returning to normal operations after a disaster. This is roughly the amount of time it's going to take you to execute your DR plan. Virtually Every other part of this process will be tied back to your RPO and RTO. So do a lot of research and think really hard about what you want these, these metrics to be. Now you're going to create a RACI. This is going to be a detailed list of every major task that happens in your DR plan. Uh, I've worked on RACIs that seem like they go on forever. They're difficult to create, uh, and this is where you're going to sort out all of the difficult business of who will actually do what when during a DR test or an actual disaster. Uh, RACI, as you can see, stands for Responsible, Accountable, Consulted, and Informed. And while this is a simple example displayed here on the screen, having a detailed RACI is crucial. It's a document you'll reference over and over through your backup planning process, and it's a document that you may need to update from time to time as well. Once you've got your RTO and RPO decisions made and you have a detailed RACI completed, you're going to start to generate a detailed plan. So if you're somebody that is uh, marked as responsible on the RACI matrix, you're going to start creating detailed documentation about all the steps that you need to complete during the test or during the disaster. You want to make sure to include testing scenarios and actual disaster scenarios since those procedures will likely differ in some way. And don't forget a failback plan. When you're doing tests, sometimes at the end of the test, you just tear everything down. But when you've got an actual disaster and you've failed over to a second site, you need to be able to fail back. And you want to make sure that that is part of the plan and that it is tested at least at some point. The best plans will We'll miss something. Uh, I love this quote, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. I don't know if you all saw this recent tweet. Uh, well, crap, uh, my colo just burned down. I'll be honest, I'm not sure if I ever had a colo burning down listed as a possibility on the DR plans I worked on. 
But these plans are living documents, and while you strive for the very best plan from the start, realistically, you will have to update it after every single DR test you conduct. You take any lessons learned, and you just incorporate those back onto the plan. All right, so with the DR plan in place, let's turn an eye to your technology stack. Virtualization and automation are two examples of technology that will make your DR planning much easier. Whether you're performing a DR to a secondary site or colo or to the cloud, it's far easier when most or all of your environment is virtualized. And to be honest, if you have a tech stack that's made up of mainframes or bare metal servers, DR will just be more difficult and more expensive. It's definitely doable. I've seen people do it. You know, many companies don't consider the sort of cost of older technology and what risk it might have to their DR posture. And I just want to drive home that point that if you're holding off on modernization because it's too hard or too expensive, consider how much time and effort that these older systems add to your DR scenarios. So if you factor that into your cost-benefit analysis, it may be worthwhile to bite the bullet and move away from yesteryear's technology. I'm biased, but as a network engineer, I think networking is one of the hardest parts. You've got to figure out if you're exposing resources to the internet, like websites or APIs, or if you're sending out emails and alerts, you've got to figure out how that's going to work through both testing and a true disaster scenario. So um, as an example, during a test, you may want to be able to bring up your secondary site without internet access. Uh, during a disaster, you probably want internet access. Uh, and you may even need to migrate IP addresses from one site to the other. Uh, there's no easy button to this, unfortunately. You just have to plan, test, and then update your plan as needed uh, with your findings so that you have a really solid understanding of how networking will function in all of these different DR scenarios. Last, DR sizing uh, for a site is tough. If you just have all the money in the world, you can just recreate uh, your infrastructure verbatim at a DR site. If you're running DR in the cloud, this is not something you have to worry about as much. Most of the people that I've worked in the past, they don't have the money to completely replicate their infrastructure. So they've got to choose to scale back in some places, maybe remove some redundancy in some places. And so when you do that, sometimes when you're running in your DR side, it can feel like Cinderella's sister is trying to cram their big feet into the glass slipper. It's just not the best fit always. But the goal is to keep your business running. So if you can tolerate a performance that is 90 or 80 percent of your production, environment, then you can save a lot of money. But that's a decision everybody's going to have to make for themselves. So hopefully I've not scared you too much. The reality is that DR planning is, is difficult. But let me show you a few ways that Rubrik can help ease this pain. Number one is simplicity. I did a lot of research into the product before I joined Rubrik, and simplicity is the thing that struck me, uh, how simple it was to install and manage. And simplicity is really at the core of the product. And it's our SLA-based protection policies that are the key to enabling that simplicity. Between our recently released support for continuous data protection or the lightning fast restores we've always had, we give you the features that you need to get up and running really fast. And this is important when you're talking about DR. Uh, my personal favorite part about our product is our APIs. They're essential for automation and we're integrated into your DR tooling, scripting, monitoring. We take an API first approach to our product and that means that the sky's the limit in terms of uh, automating our product through PowerShell or Python and tools like that. Finally, whether you're using the cloud for DR or simply is an archive target to replace tape, Rubrik has features allowing you to convert your VMs into cloud native images, which is very useful for DR, or simply leverage inexpensive object storage for long-term archives. This is what our SLA domain configuration looks like. This is all you need to meet your RPO. Set when your snapshots are taken and you configure archiving and retention settings, and then Rubrik takes care of the rest. Uh, there's no more job sprawl. Uh, this is as close to the sort of Ron Popeil set it and forget it as you will get in, in IT. I did want to highlight continuous data protection. It's shown right here as this little checkbox. It's some really amazing tech. Uh, you can get a recovery point objective of one minute, uh, and you can select recovery points down to the second. So it's fully integrated into the SLA policy. So once your environment is prepped, it's just clicking one button and you enable CDP for the whole SLA. Uh, SLA domains are the killer feature that put us ahead of other solutions, but zooming out quickly, you can see how these pieces all fit together. To get started, all you need to do is add your existing uh, hypervisor or vCenter or whatever you're running in your environment. You add that to a rubric, and then you create an SLA policy defining the retention and archiving settings you just saw. You apply that to you know a set of VMs or your whole cluster, and at that point, you're protected. It's that easy. 
You also get a ton of speed and flexibility with Rubrik. It's one of the things that we're most proud of. We have a custom-built scale-out file system that means you can quickly clone or restore VMs in a matter of seconds. In a DR situation, timing is critical. And the faster you can restore, uh, even huge VMs, the better. And we really excel in that department. So hopefully that was some helpful information to get you started with your disaster recovery process and not too daunting. If you want more information, please go over to rubric.com. Click on that button in the middle of the page. It says get the Gartner report. You can find out why Gartner has put us in the, as a leader in their magic quadrant. And then for more information, you can click the contact sales button up at the top of the page or feel free to reach out to me on Twitter at Network Brouhaha, and I will get you in touch with somebody to get you some more information. Thanks so much for your time today. All right, cool presentation, Matt. Love the humor in there in those slides. And of course, love your Twitter handle as well, Network Brew, haha. Very cool. Uh, I've just brought up the poll question for everyone out there in the audience. Uh, who wants more information about Rubric? Uh, what would you like? Just answer there on the poll. Um, thank you for the great comments coming in about Matt's presentation as well as the others. Also, thank you for the good questions. We're about to kick off our final panel discussion here answering our poll or answering the questions that have come in from you out there in the audience. Uh, first, I want to just give everyone a chance here to answer this poll. So I'll give you a few seconds to complete that. All right, thank you everyone who responded to the poll question. It's now time for our panel discussion or Q&A panel. And we will be chatting now with Ashwin Shetty, Product Marketing Manager at Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Dustin Albertson, Manager for Cloud and Application Alliances at Veeam, and Mr. Matt Elliott, Developer Advocate at Rubrik. Let's get started. Ashwin, this question's for you. How can I start with HPE Cloud Volumes? Thanks, David. Users can start by logging into cloudvolumes.hp.com, uh, where they'll get details about our services pricing along with product videos and other assets that will help them understand the offering better and probably get started with cloud volumes, either block or uh, backup. Excellent. Matt, this question's for you. Where do I need to focus my staffing resources to get started with DR? So I think the most important um, staff member, or group of staff members, uh, when it comes to planning and executing disaster recovery is actually project managers. So having a, a good project management team that can really uh, shape the process from, from the very beginning and then, uh, you know, document it and um, set, set goals for success or failure and really measure that whole, monitor that whole process as it goes along. Uh, that's really crucial to the process. Uh, and you know, ha just having a great project manager in general is going to make your whole disaster recovery planning and exercise and testing. All of those things are going to be just so much easier with a, with a good project manager. So that's where I would start. Excellent advice. Dustin, this question is for you. They're asking if you have any recommendations around automation. Yeah, good question. So um, primarily, I would say use tagging. Uh, so tagging uh, within AWS. So you can tag your instances. Uh, to be part of a certain policy. And then when you build out your policy within Veeam Backup uh, for AWS, you can uh, set your policy to uh, automatically add you know, instances based on those tags. So um, as you install new workloads or as you deploy new instances, you just add that tag to it and they'll be automatically uh, pulled into those policies for protection. Excellent. And Ashwin, how fast can you recover data with HPE Cloud Volumes Backup? Excellent question, David. Cloud Volumes Backup is built on Catalyst API. We have very efficient and fast source side built-in deduplication so that only unique changes uh, to the data is sent across the cloud. This allows for faster RDOs and RPOs than other cloud-based backup solutions. Very nice. Matt, next question here is for you. What sort of features should I be looking for in products needed for DR planning? I believe one of the things you really need to focus on when you're looking at your technology stack in general, and in terms of disaster recovery, this make, will also make your life much easier, is if you are implementing products that have a fully featured API that's um, you know, well-documented and easy to consume, uh, that's something Rubrik has. Uh, but even if you're not even looking at Rubrik, I would highly suggest that you are 
really requiring your vendors to include an API in their products because once that API is there, then that opens up a whole world of automation that you can do. And the more you can automate during a disaster, uh, the, the smoother things are gonna go. So you wanna remove the chance for human error and automation will do that for you. And you can you know, sometimes automate things without an API, but if that API is there, it's really gonna, gonna make your life easier. Excellent advice. And Dustin, next question is for you. There's a number of questions here around security. Do you have any recommendations for disaster recovery security? Yeah, yeah, great, great question. So um, one thing I would recommend is, is cross account. And, and what I mean by that is, is definitely having a, a AWS account that you're just using for backup. So um, you would create a new account, you would deploy Veeam backup for AWS inside of it, and then you would back up your, your production AWS account outside of it. Um, we have, we leverage IAM rules for that for security reasons. Um, you could also encrypt the repository and encrypt the traffic. Um, so it's 100% it's secure that way, but you're, you're kind of minimizing your failure domain there. So backing up outside of that account uh, provides you a little bit of security. There's limited uh, people who have access to that account. So, you know, you're kind of preventing yourself or, or uh, protecting yourself from a rogue admin or, or anybody who deletes all those instances or deletes, you know, the root AWS account. So... Um, that's what I would recommend, both cross-account and uh, encryption. Okay, great advice. Thank you. And Ashwin, there's another question here for you. This one is about uh, cloud lock-in when it comes to egress charges with cloud volumes backup. How does that work? Yeah, unlike other cloud-based uh, approaches, we are uniquely bringing customers a fresh approach to backup with the ability to put backup data to work in any cloud with no lock-ins or egress charges when they are recovering their backup data from HP Cloud Volumes Backup. Excellent. Matt, next question here is for you. What needs to be done with my internet service provider during a disaster? Uh, that's a great question, and it's something that people overlook a lot or they're not really sure where to get started. Um, a lot of this gets down into the weeds of sort of how the internet works, uh, and if you've ever you know, had to configure a router with BGP, you, you might know where I'm going here, but um, if you uh, are a company that owns your own um, uh, IP range, uh, then you need to work with your upstream carriers to be able to possibly advertise that range from uh, your disaster recovery site. And so that is just a logistical exercise that needs to be done with your ISP. Uh, sort it out with them and you'll get a thing called a letter of agency or maybe they'll give you some sort of other document that you need to be able to advertise your address range elsewhere. So. Uh, your main site goes down, you can then, you know, swing all of your IP addresses over somewhere else. And that's really the first step. Now, if you don't own that IP address range, then you might have to work with your ISP uh, and figure something else out. And there are other ways to get around that, but they get into a little bit more complicated space. So um, I would just say, you know, and today, if you don't own your IP address range, maybe that's something that you look at doing. Uh, before you start your, your disaster recovery planning. Because that, again, when you own that range and you can sort of advertise it from wherever you need to be, uh, that's going to make your life a lot easier. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. And Dustin, there's a, obviously a lot of interest here in trying out Veeam Backup for AWS. Um, how should people do that? What do you, what do you recommend? Yeah, so uh, another good question. There's a couple of different methods. So as I mentioned in the marketplace, there's three editions. Um, there's a uh, free trial edition there is a free edition and then there's a BYOL edition, um, or I should say purchase the marketplace edition. So the easiest method would be to go deploy the free edition. So there's, it's a free edition. Um, there's no licensing uh, needed for it. There's no billing associated with it. You can protect up to 10 EC2 instances. Um, you only get email support on that and there's no time limit. So you can protect 10 instances for you know, as long as you wanna deploy it. Um, again, there's a, a free trial edition. So if you're an already existing Veeam customer and you have VBR on-prem, um, you can leverage your VUL licenses or you can get a ask for your sales, uh, you know, your sales agent to give you a, a, a license and they can give you a license and you can try it out that way as well. So there's a couple of different approaches. Just, you know, reach out and ask. Awesome. Thanks, Dustin. Sure. All right, cool panel discussion. Thank you everyone out there in the audience for the great questions. And of course, thank you to our expert presenters. 
and all of our sponsors on today's event, NetApp, Faction, Wheela, HPE, Veeam, and Rubrik. We even had a special guest from Google Cloud. Really cool stuff. It's now time to announce our three Amazon $100 prize winners. These are going out to Chrissy Sutton from California, Ken Bunce from Illinois, and Mike McTeague from Massachusetts. Congratulations to the prize winners. I will post the names there in the questions box as well. Before you go, I want to remind you to subscribe to the 10 on Tech podcast. It's over in the iTunes store, and I hope that you will join us on our next event. Uh, that's actually uh, coming up next week. And when as soon as we end this webinar, you will be automatically redirected to our events webpage where you can register for all of our upcoming events. So I hope that you'll check it out. Thank you so much for everyone joining us on today's webinar. I hope that you have a great Friday and a great weekend. We will see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye.